Open University. Greetings, students. I'm in the bathroom of quite an expensive hotel on the Tiergarten in Berlin. Uh, it's actually right next to the South Korean embassy. Um, my windows give probably politically compromising views into the offices of the South Korean embassy. And I can report that uh, there's nobody to be seen in there. It could be the North Korean embassy, that could be even more interesting. Uh, and today, the reason I'm in this hotel is because um, I'm working for an institution, unusually um, working for the Hauster Kultur in der Welt for the next three days. And uh, um, I'm on their, I don't know what you call it, technically steering committee or advisory board, something like that. And it's a four-year position. I, I sort of signed up for this without really looking at the small print. And it actually, it's actually a recurring position that will last for the next four Mays. It'll be like three days each May until 20, um, 2021 or something, um, in which I'll be... Uh, flown into Berlin to help them determine their policy. I really am not a corporate animal in any sense, or an institutional animal, and I don't know how, how this is going to be, but um, I must be the wild card. There's, uh, I think, eight people on this uh, committee, and today we're just being shown around the excellent uh, exhibitions at Hester Kultur in der Welt, which are um, a, uh, they're both Asian. One is called Two or Three Tigers, the main exhibition, and there's a secondary exhibition by an Australian uh, Thai curator, um, which is called Misfits. And they're both very good, in fact, the best exhibitions I've seen in Berlin in an institution this month. Um, other good stuff, I, I saw yesterday a couple of um, excellent things. The uh, Alte Museum, which just has a, 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 a thing upstairs about the Etruscans, which really um, inspired me to take my rail pass, which begins on Thursday, and go to a lot of those Etruscan sites, which are mostly burial sites, tumuli, as I believe they're called, um, because the Etruscan city is kind of recapitulated. It doesn't really exist. There aren't really still Etruscan cities out there, but there are cities of the dead. There are necropoli, uh, and the cities of the dead recapitulate in some ways, repeat the uh, structures of the cities of the living. So, and there was a kind of ancestor worship thing going on in Etruscan civilization. <coughs> so, and sometimes it was integrated into uh, Roman culture, and other times it, it wasn't. But it's, it's a civilization which has fascinated people, notably D.H. Lawrence, who wrote Etruscan Places, which I read uh, a long time ago, and was fascinated by it. Because Lawrence, he's a bit like me, he sort of has his own hobby horses, his own sort of enthusiasms which he projects onto other cultures, and sex, of course, is something, or primitive expressiveness. These are the things which he wanted to project onto Etruscan culture. There's also a very nice little exhibition as part of the Alta Museum of um, sex in ancient, the ancient world, and lots of sort of clay figures of <clears throat> characters with enormous phalluses and things like that. And it's, it's always reassuring for some reason to see that people in the past not only had sex, evidence the fact that we're here, I mean, they had to have sex for us to exist at all, but also the fact that they really enjoyed sex and they had a culture of sex. They had a, a fully integrated sexual culture, which is something I think we kind of lack a little bit. We, in our sort of combination of, of rationalism and irrationalism, in other words, this sort of mechanical bureaucratic structure in which everything, uh, commercial as well, in which everything is very ordered and logical, but also the kind of um, crazy tinfoil hat kind of irrationalism, conspiracy theory and you know cosmology and all the rest of it that we go in for. Somewhere in between those two things is sex. And sex is something I've been thinking about recently because I've been reading those two dear friends uh, from about a hundred years ago, Guillaume Apollinaire and Blaise Sondoise, who were um, applying a kind of uh, early Dada attitude to um, libertinism, French or Swiss aristocratic libertinism. Um, Blaise Sondrais was a, the pen name of a Swiss aristocrat, Swiss French aristocrat. Um, Apollinaire I think came from East Europe actually, but again from aristocratic stock and 
in continental Europe, the aristocrats usually have a, a not so distant memory of um, sexual libertinism, um, having their wicked way with their servants and so on. So those two novels, uh, the one is called um, Mort à Virgin, uh, and um, concerns the adventures of this crazy ex-aristocrat poet, or murderer in fact. He's a murderer who's in an insane asylum and is released by the narrator who then accompanies him around Europe and they witness the Russian Revolution and all sorts of things, or preparations for the Russian Revolution anyway. Um, and, uh, and the other novel by Apollinaire, Apollinaire who wrote Les Onze Mille Verges, which is actually quite a similar novel of sexual rampage to Moreau Virgin, but um, uh, in this case it's Apollinaire's um, other erotic novel, The Adventures of the Young Don Juan, which is actually a sort of disguised autobiography. Um, unfortunately, I've put both those books, with all my books, which I bought this time, I must have bought a whole shelf's worth of books in the second-hand bookstores of Berlin. I put them all into my storage in the interests of travelling light in Italy and elsewhere when my train pass starts. So I'm, I'm feeling the itch, which I kind of have to resist, to start buying new second-hand books to take on that train journey, because obviously on a train journey you want books. At the same time, you want a portable bag. Um, and I really, I really stress portability. Uh, if I'm going to be traipsing around tumuli, I really need a light bag. Um, otherwise, I'm going to feel like I should be in the tombs with the dead. Um, lightness and life are the same thing, really. Um, the other thing I saw, the other exhibition I saw yesterday was uh, uh, the Musical Instruments Museum, which is one of my favourite museums in Berlin, has a special exhibition about early synthesizers just now, which is really sweet. Um, some fantastic, charismatic machines, briefcase synthesizers, the EMS, the um, um, there's one called a magic box or something, and um, <clears throat> with lots of beautiful coloured curly cables and uh, um, emulator twos. The the the, the record that uh, the my first album Circus Maximus features an emulator two. It sounds pretty acoustic, but actually it's um, at least fifty percent electronic that that record. And uh, so we used these sampled acoustic sounds made possible by the emulator two, which was a kind of slightly more mass market version of the Fairlight sampler, which famously cost the price of a house when it was first uh, released. And, but this became an affordable thing. I think they were, the Emulator 2 was about £10,000 and Holger Hiller famously bought one when he came to London and rented it out. Not only rented it out, but rented himself out as a, a technical um, advisor and programmer so that he came with the machine to the studio. Uh, we didn't we didn't rent it from him. We rented one without an operator and just worked out me and Neil Martin, who'd been in my band, the Happy Family, who was playing on Circus Maximus, just worked out how to use it. It had these kind of floppy disks and a great big housing, you know. We we used standard sounds that came on the floppies that came with it. We didn't do any sampling ourselves. Um, but it's always nice to go to a museum and sort of see, it's like when you go to the Museum of Childhood and you see the toys you used to play with when you were a kid. Oh yes, I had that, you know. And you realise how you are formatted by the, um, the available technology at the time. So, uh, yeah, a really great exhibition. And um, I, I went home and did a Tumblr update where I, I sort of poised, counterpoised the photos of the um, amazing people from 2,000 years ago who are the, the portraits of them, busts of them. Uh, when people died, often you had a bust made of that person so that they could decorate your house and you could sort of say hello to them every day. It's strange that we don't do that, actually. It's strange that we, nobody... You don't go to someone's house and, and he says, oh, here's my ex-wife, and points to a, a statue or a bust. You think it would be quite a logical thing to do. They, people do stuff their cats and dogs sometimes and say, oh, here's my dead dog. They don't stuff their spouses, obviously, but uh, you'd think they would have some sculptures. But anyway, yes, I, I, I made this um, juxtaposition, which I think might be important for the forthcoming record, although it could as easily describe the last record, you know, songs like um, The Death of Empedocles, in which there is a kind of combination of charismatic synthesizers from maybe 40 years ago and charismatic busts and statues and sculptures from the ancient world 
I'm still very, as I was obviously when I made Circus Maximus, which is a record about the ancient world, the Bible and ancient Greece essentially, um, I'm still fascinated by that period and by the things we recognize about our common humanity with those people, because they are essentially people like us and they are they're as smart as us, you know, they don't have our technology obviously and they're still figuring things out, I mean hence Empedocles thinking that everything is made up of earth, water, fire, uh, air, um, or thinking that motion was the only kind of change. We don't believe those things anymore, but we, um, we have the same intellectual apparatus. So somehow it's a bit like when I invented analog Baroque, you know, this idea of putting analog synths together with, uh, with the Baroque period, you know, which obviously wasn't my idea, other people had had that idea before me. Um, because, of, because our synths were um, monophonic when they were first invented, uh, you basically were drawn almost automatically to the kind of counterpoint music of the Baroque period where you had a bass line and then you had a melody line above it and they, that's really all you needed was these two lines. So uh, it was easier with the, you, you didn't have to use chords, you know, or you couldn't use chords with those early synths. Um, but, but somehow the, um, those things appeal to me, either, either juxtaposing ancient European uh, or Asian, since the Greek Empire extended into Turkey, um, and that Turkey for me is where Asia begins. That's why you know, I've been happy living in this uh, in Neukölln in a very Asian environment, because the Turks essentially create an Asian environment wherever they go, or semi-Asian, a near-Asian. Near environment and now I'm up here in Tiergarten and it feels horribly white bread. I really hate, you know, I walked down yesterday to try to find a, a grocery shop that was open and, and I walked for miles from my hotel without finding a single shop. Eventually I got to um, the Kufurstan Dam, the top of the Kufurstan Dam and there's a place called Bikini Berlin there which is a big shopping centre which is actually um, quite a nice place. It's got some good, like the Artec shop where you can get good coffee. And there's even an Edeka supermarket there, which is open on Sundays. Amazing for Germany. So I was able to stock up on food and bring it back to my hotel. But uh, generally, these touristy, it's a bit like West London, you know, West Berlin. It's generally people in these skinny jeans and mesh caps, you know, expensive mesh caps, which is even tr more tragic. These terribly conformist young people who seem to just be everywhere, especially in summer, in their groups, you know. Um, with their expensive trainers. I really despise the conformity of the young, I have to say. I also despise the conformity of the old, and I've just been down to breakfast in this rather expensive hotel, and uh, it's full of old people. These expensive hotels are always nothing but people in their 60s and 70s, and they, they were staring at me like I was a freak from space, which is quite a nice feeling, actually, you know, being a, a Bowie fan. I, I probably do model myself a little bit on a freak from space, but uh, just because, it's simply because I've chosen to um, to make a little bit of an effort to not be part of this conformist monoculture, which is now global, uh, which is mesh caps and skinny jeans and tra expensive trainers. Partly because I can't afford those things, but also because I'm just an original spirit, damn it, and I'm not going to buckle under to this awful global monoculture. And this is some. This this might come up in the uh, the introductory speech I have to give tomorrow. Uh, tonight we're just being shown the exhibitions and being jollied up uh, at the Hasticulture and Develt. But tomorrow we have to pitch ourselves in a little speech, and I've opted to speak about these videos as a kind of didactic. Um, uh, uh, sort of various angles on these. This is a, a sort of self-appointed didacticism. Uh, it's also the idea of making a, a, an institution, an amateur institution, which doesn't claim any particular status and in fact allows itself a certain speed and mobility by not having that institutional framework. I'm, I'm able to say whatever I want here in, on YouTube. Um, obviously everyone has the same right and this is part of the, the pleasure as well as the, um, the problematic of our current age, because we're full of, we're all commentators now, we're all sort of pontificating public personalities, and uh, if we want to be anyway. And um, that's interesting, but it's also, it's a Babel. We've created a, a Tower of Babel, which um, other people are clever enough to exploit for their marketing and merchandising.
potentials of it. Um, I'm just creating content in a naive and uh, egocentric way, but um, but also, I don't know, what are the themes that I want to talk about? I want to talk about that, about amateurism, about um, being an intellectual outside an institutional framework, and also what an institution can do to help original spirits in general, but also the idea of, uh, I think I'm interested in my own Calvinist feelings about um, uh, things being evil. I still believe very strongly, and this is part of my Scottish Calvinist tradition, I believe that there is such a thing as evil, and I believe that the world is actually flirting at the moment dangerously with evil. I think these uh, the new populist movements are not only irrational, but they're a kind of embrace of evil. And I think actually, if, we, if you want to look for a rationality in them, the rationality is simply that people have a general apprehension at the moment that there is going to be, they do believe in climate change, or they do believe that there is some catastrophe looming uh, on a global scale. Uh, they don't want to look at it rationally. They don't want to say, okay, let, what can we do to fix the climate? What they say is, okay, we have too many people in the world, we're overpopulating the world, we need to get rid of millions, if not billions, of those people, um, and uh, the climate's going to be, uh, there's going to be winners and losers. So this already, this sort of um, social Darwinist, um, uh, Hobbesian kind of worldview kicks in. And I think people are simply, what they're doing now, uh, and this is, this is why I use lines like brushing up upon my rusty evil. I use that line in um, Skobelotcher's, uh, in the song Bashi Bazooks. I think people essentially are brushing up on the idea of how they can be evil because they want to be, um, they think that the, the wicked will flourish like the green bay tree, as it says in the Bible, in this coming time of difficulty and e ecological <coughs> and demographic catastrophe. And so they want to be evil um, in order to not care that, that millions of people, probably from poor countries, are suffering. And uh, they simply want to, they want to adopt a kind of unfeeling, uncaring, I'm all right, Jack philosophy, which is, um, you know, there's sheep and goats, there's the good seed, there's the bad seed, and we don't give a damn what happens to those poor people who can't look out for themselves. So it's the opposite of any kind of egalitarianism or any kind of humanitarian attitude. And what we're seeing is a downgrading uh, especially in these populist authoritarian philosophies, so any kind of sense of looking out for somebody other than yourself or your immediate family or people from your immediate nation. This is, you know, and I, I've said this before in these talks, you have to counter that with the idea that um, actually most people at the moment in the world are, are attaining more equality if you look at, at, at the international level. So people who were poor in places like China and India are now much less poor and in fact are threatening to overtake us, especially in the case of China, soon to be in the case of India. Africa is a different state. Africa doesn't seem to um, be able to, to do that. But China is developing the infrastructure in Africa and um, doing a lot of trade and, and stuff with Africa. So we'll have to see what happens with that. But uh, anyway, I think this new fascism, let's call a spade a spade, is, which thankfully was defeated in France, thank God, thank you French people. Um, although, of course, we still have 30% of the French voters voting for a fascist. Um, I see it as a, as a preparation for some kind of uh, atrocities of the future, which will either be humanly created or at least condoned by humans who could solve the problems. I believe the problems are easily within our reach to solve if we're creative. I've been reading a um, creativity book, which I have in my storage, uh, which was a big influence on me in my teens, this whole idea, of, essentially a religious idea of one's own or creativity in general being a way out of problems, um, but also, you know, uh, the, the engine of art and of much of culture. Um, I didn't realize at the time I was reading this in the 70s that it was actually based on research that came out of the 50s. And it was research that was based on the space race and the American intuition that it, its education system was failing. The Soviets were doing pretty well with their space um, satellites, rockets, and so on, and actually beating the Americans. And the Americans, the National Science Research Council set up all these conferences um, in the, well, really from the early 50s right through to the, the early 60s um, to 
try to counter this and try to make, make uh, science students and also art students more creative in America. So actually a lot of this, um, what we see is just the sudden appearance of creativity and freewheeling and uh, divergence and all the rest of it in the 60s has its roots in the 50s. And it's very striking. I was just um, looking at a, a thing Frank Barron said in this, uh, this book of um, essays. A lot of them are about how to nurture and encourage creativity in pupils at schools and in universities. Frank Barron says um, that uh, you need an open environment. You know that nations need to reproduce within themselves and cities for that matter too the conditions which um, pertain in individuals, to make individuals more creative. In other words, you need a, a freedom from hostility. Obviously, you need that whole um, pyramid, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of values, where you, you need the basic, uh, at the bottom of the pyramid is uh, you know, shelter, food, work, um, a social network of support. Then, it, as it gets up towards the tip, you're getting much closer to artistic things like self-actualization, self-expression, freedom of expression, things like that. So, Barron is saying, and this is again it's from an, an essay in 1955, he's saying we need open societies, freedom of movement. He actually uses the phrase freedom of expression and freedom of movement. These things are built into the European constitution, the worldview of the European Union to be creative, to be, to be free to move around. Of course there's a neoliberal component to them, but um, essentially the European Union is, continues to be, has been a political unit which is about um, preventing war, locally at least in Europe. So, but it's also about trying to enable people creatively in, in those senses. Freedom of movement is absolutely central. It's very tragic that countries like Britain and the US are now working doing all in their power to actually restrict, for instance, freedom of movement, which is an absolute precondition of uh, healthy, fertile culture. So that maybe this is something I'll be talking about in my pitch um, tomorrow, who knows. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm here until Thursday and then I'm off to Italy. I was just joking today with someone about why am I always in uh, uh, axis, x-axis powers countries um, spend, but if I have the chance, the choice anyway, spend most of my time in Japan, Italy and Germany, all of which of course were fascist in the last war. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, uh, uh, actually this guy who's a writer for the Japan Times, a music writer for the Japan Times, was saying that uh, he thinks it's because defeated countries um, just started again from zero, had no hubris basically. Um, just said, okay, let's just let's impose new constitutions or have them imposed on us from somebody else. Somebody who perhaps doesn't take their own constitution as seriously as we take it, having it imposed on us. And let's start again industrially, let's build new factories, let's uh, really um, work hard. So this is what Germany and Japan especially have been doing. But also I think, there's, uh, getting back to the Calvinist theme, I think there's, it's very important that guilt and a sense, a lack of hubris, in a sense, was was always part of the uh, the um, German and Japanese way, anyway. A sense of having to uh, atone for probably guilt or something. Um, so I'll just I'll call it a day there, and um, see you next time. Open University. Yeah.